Okay, so welcome to the winter seed sowing. Now, if you can see my, can you see the first slide? All right, excellent. So my name is Jennifer White with the Portage Park District and my awesome colleague, Becca Rohde. Rolling in, nice to see everybody. We are super excited to, to be here with you today and to teach you one of the easiest ways that you're going to find, in my opinion, to get started in the native seed, native plant world. So we are gonna do some winter seed sowing. If you have a kit, you're welcome to do it, do this activity along with us. If you don't have a kit, um, we're gonna equip you with the information that you need to do to, to plant your own and to use whatever kind of container that you have available, whatever kind of seed that you have available. So before we get into the actual planting though, I'm gonna run through just a brief, and really I could spend hours talking about this topic, but we're gonna do a brief um, intro into uh, why we're doing, why we're even, why do we even care about uh, using native plants and native seeds in our landscapes and, um, and why this type of, or this method of seeding is so simple and easy and effective. Uh, so here at the Portage Park District, um, most of you are probably already signed up and plugged into our, um, our newsletter. We have a monthly e-newsletter that tells you what's coming up in the parks, what's happening. Our mission is to conserve our local natural heritage and to provide opportunities for all of you to come and enjoy them. So we don't have uh, you know, playgrounds and things like that at our parks. Uh, we use nature as the playground and uh, offer ways to connect you to our really, really interesting and rich natural heritage in Portage County. Um, thanks in advance for being interested in uh, getting into native plants and growing them or continuing to grow them. There are lots of wonderful reasons why uh, it is not only fun, but super valuable for our local ecology for you to be growing native plants. And so the first um, reason is because you're attracting and supporting native local wildlife. So these plants and these insects and animals have co-evolved together and uh, some of them have really, really specific specialist relationships between animal or insect and plant. And so um, when you're growing these in your landscape, you're both providing food and shelter and support for those uh, native critters. Next, promoting our regional biodiversity. So our local and our local ecoregion in this area collecting seed or purchasing seed that is grown um, in our region, um, you're contributing to the genetic biodiversity of this area. So thank you. Uh, using native plants reduces soil erosion because native plants generally have really deep um, extensive root systems. And so they hold the soil in place and keep that from eroding. They're also pretty hardy. So they require less or little or no fertilizer than a lot of our cultivars and um, uh, ornamental plants. And they require less watering. They are adapted to our, our conditions here. And they're just a, a, an easy, hardy, you know, hardy group of uh, plants to grow. And, you know, I mentioned about ornamentals and I really would like to us to start, myself included, start changing the conversation and um, looking at our native plants as ornamentals, um, looking at there are so many really interesting and attractive flowering plants, trees, shrubs that look great, that we can use in our landscape that are hardy for this area and that provide all of that biodiversity um, and native wildlife support. So uh, they thrive under these natural conditions. And I put in their positive cultural impact. And what I mean by that is that you and I, all of us that are here on the, the call today can make a big impact in our neighborhoods, with our family, with our friends, by showing how these plants can be used in our landscape. Um, instead of bringing plants in from you know, other countries and other regions, if we're using the really interesting plants that we have that, are, uh, that grow here and support our, our native ecology, um, we set a good example and uh, sometimes people just need to see it first. So you guys are doing a great job in um, starting that journey or continuing that journey in um, keeping those plants uh, going in your, in your landscape. So we've got um, more people in Portage County who are, are doing, um, are showing how these can be used as landscape ornamentals. So everything's connected. 
if you love birds like I do, um, these are just a couple birds that are normally seed eaters, but you see that little black capped chickadee with the mouthful of uh, caterpillars. Well, they feed their young caterpillars, as do most of our songbirds, like over 90% of the songbirds um, in this area will feed their young using caterpillars because they're soft bodied and they provide um, plant nutrients for the growing that are needed by their growing chicks. And they require a lot of them, like a, uh, the chickadee, the black capped chickadee that you see there in the middle, um, that uh, they require anywhere from, depending on which study you read, six to 9,000 caterpillars just to raise one little clutch of, um, of chick young chickadee chicks. And so that's a lot of caterpillars. So we need plants to support the caterpillars. And historically, culturally, with landscaping and gardening, we would often look at um, what you see here, this plant getting munched on by some uh, little larva. Well, we want to welcome that. So it's shifting the way that we think um, about the plants that are in our landscape. We want to put plants in that caterpillars um, will eat um, so that we've got more bird food, so that we promote this healthy, healthy food chain. Sometimes that damage that we see on our leaves, that if you back up and take a, a broad look at your garden, you're not even gonna notice. We only notice it when we're up close. Um, and I celebrate that because sometimes it's not even the caterpillar. Sometimes it's leaf cutter bees. Like how cool is that little guy? Sometimes what we're doing in our gardens, um, if, we're, if we're thinking about how it's all connected, we see, start to see these uh, queen bumblebees that are gonna be emerging here in early spring um, from their winter slumber and starting an entire colony of bumblebees, which are the, one of the best uh, buzz pollinators. They grab a hold of the little flowers and, uh, and buzz to shake the, shake the uh, pollen out. Well, if you like to grow tomatoes, like I like to grow tomatoes, here's some of my tomatoes from last year, that cannot be possible without the help of um, pollinators like the bumblebees. So it's all connected and we fit into that. And so what we're trying to do is by using native plants in our landscape, we're making our landscape functional. So we're making it, um, we're having plants that caterpillars, see that over here on the top left, we've got a monarch um, caterpillar that's on one of my swamp milkweeds. Um, we're putting, uh, we're having like right here in the center, we've got uh, one of the families of um, our native bees that uh, are specialists for ironweed, um, that one's tall ironweed that it's um, nectaring on. And we can even create, use some of these plants if you visited Morgan Park, uh, right at the trailhead, there is a rain garden that uh, we installed, it's been two summers ago now, and uh, that has grown and changed. It looks a whole lot different now than that. This was the picture from its first spring, um, but this is a, using native plants to not only provide wildlife quality, but also to help impact water quality by having a little speed bump for that stormwater to um, collect and slowly drain down into, um, into the ground. So using these, choosing plants that are local to our eco region that support the native wildlife there um, is functional, but it's also beautiful. It's also beautiful. So you can take some of the plants and I um, historically, you know, I've been a gardener my entire life and I definitely was drawn to, ooh, look at this different plant. Ooh, look at this. And the more I learned as, you know, I went to school and um, got, got more involved in understanding these relationships, I realized that things that are beautiful to my eyes um, aren't beautiful to the insects that we need to support in our, our local eco region. And so um, swapping out those plants that are either doing harm by being invasive or that aren't providing some kind of ecological function um, is something that I've been, I've changed over the past two decades. So Here's the other fun part about um, growing some of these plants is that you create on each one of these plants, these little micro habitats. Now I'm gonna use the example of milkweed because lots of people are familiar with the monarch butterfly, but uh, this is the caterpillar on the left. It's the adult on the right. The plant that the caterpillar is on is swamp milkweed. The butterfly is on the flower of common milkweed. And uh, we also have butterfly weed, which is, those are the three easiest, most common milkweed plants to grow in this area that are, um, that are native to this region. And sometimes we just think about that monarch butterfly, but when you start planting any of these plants, not just milkweed, you'll learn that there is a whole little community that also uses that particular plant. And it's really fun to watch. So this is a swamp milkweed beetle. 
This is a, um, a milkweed bug. It looks very similar to the box elder bug. Um, one way to distinguish it, um, and these are some of the nymphs, um, is it has this horizontal black band across its back. The box elder bugs will have a, they have a cross. So a little X on their back. Uh, but you'll see these often on the seed pods. It's not harming the plant. This is a little microhabitat that is um, of, of critters that are using this plant. This little guy down here is a milkweed beetle. I will find these usually on common milkweed, but I've also seen them on swamp milkweed. Um, and then you'll get these aphids that, uh, you know, we think, oh my gosh, the aphids. Well, the aphids usually come in um, later in the season. Um, there are ants that are on that uh, that are farming those little aphids. And really any aphid, if, if you've got a little colony of aphids of any species um, on a plant, you can, um, if you look closely, you'll usually see a few ants that are there because the aphids, as they're sucking the juices out of the plant, they're also producing a little sweet honeydew that they're, they're just, they're getting rid of. And as they squirt that out, the ants are lapping that up and using that sweet honeydew. Um, so they will, they will often protect those little colonies of aphids. And and then you have uh, critters like this, which is one of the uh, larval forms of one of the uh, lady beetles or ladybugs. Uh, and it, they, they are incredible carnivores that love to feast on, on aphids. So you just have all of these interesting relationships that are going on just on one plant. So have fun with this as you start to grow some of these different plants. And it will become, maybe it will become like like for me and, and Becca also, it will become this, this fun daily entertainment. So this is common bone set. Um, and on this, there are dozens of different kinds of wasps and bees and flies and beetles. And just being able to watch them um, uh, nectar, watch them pick up pollen. Um, this is Monarda or bee balm. And there's a hummingbird moth that's in here, a clear wing moth. There are a few different types of bees that are in there. There are some flies and some, um, and some beetles that are also visiting that. It's so much fun to watch and see what's using it. And even looking on your, in the area around your garden. So um, I had a nice little video, but PowerPoint decided to not let me play it today. Uh, this is uh, the underside of one of my deck chairs on my patio. And I had a mason bee that decided the drainage holes would be the perfect place to, um, to build a nest. And so I got to watch this. They're only out for a short period of time in March, um, in the spring. And I got to watch this mason bee bring a little ball of you know, what we call bee bread, little pollen and nectar um, up into one of those holes. And then she lays one single egg and then packs that with mud and then goes back and gets another little ball, collects the nectar and pollen, um, pops it in there, lays an egg until she's got a series of these uh, little cases, these little places for, um, for her young to uh, grow and develop over the season. And then they'll hatch out in March again this next year. So um, really fun to start watching and seeing what's going on in your, um, in your garden and what kind of uh, fun critters you can learn about while you're growing these native plants. So I love it. It will change or you'll be amazed at how many um, different insects and birds then and um, other animals that you start to see in your yard. So it's really great and it looks beautiful. So winter seed sowing. So we can move on to that. And does anybody have any questions about just about native plants in general before I move into the activity today? All right. So we are doing, and, and while we are using jugs, you don't have to use, um, use a jug. I will talk about containers in a bit here. Um, but the value of doing this method, um, first it's simple and easy really is, is quite simple and easy. You're going to be amazed at how fast this goes. But this mimics the natural conditions that we would see um, if you were, if you had a, a, an aster or a goldenrod or any number of our native plants um, go to seed and drop, you know, there's, they produce copious amounts of seed. Some of them, they will, the seed will drop onto the ground many of those little pieces of seed will be used to fuel other animals. So small mammals, um, birds, even some insects, um, will eat those, those seeds that have been naturally sown. Um, those seeds that survive that um, will go through the freeze and the thaw and the rain and the snow, hopefully snow, someday snow, <laughs> fingers crossed. Um, and they will go through all of those natural conditions um, 
that help them to not only self seed but, or to plant, be planted, but also to, uh, in some cases, they need to be stratified. You need to have stratification, which is that, um, that cold, cold uh, temperature, having that freeze in order to stimulate uh, germination in the spring. So it mimics the natural conditions that that seed would be exposed to. It also though, doing this method protects those seeds from predation. So if you've got those, if you want to, if you want some of that seed to survive and you want to know where it is, um, this allows you to protect the seed, mimic the natural conditions, and then gives you the grower control of where you're going to put the, the finished product um, in your yard. And I like that um, part that that's one of my favorite um, reasons for doing you know, favorite benefits of uh, doing this method. Uh, for example, I had a uh, smooth um, blue aster, have a smooth blue aster, well, lots of them in my yard. And um, I really, really liked the look of the plant. And so instead of what I generally will do is um, on my heavy seed, heavy sowing plants, because I have a small yard, um, I will generally cut back. I don't cut the whole plant back. I leave that for um, some of the other insects that would use those as, as stem nesters, but I will cut off the seed heads of the plants that freely sow profusely. Um, so it gives me a little bit more control over where things um, end up. But I had a smooth blue aster that I really, really enjoyed the look of. They kind of have a, a long bluish green leaf, um, just a, a really nice color. They're a late, uh, late season bloomer, which helps support our late season pollinators. And so I decided to let it do its thing. And so it did its thing. And so I ended up with lots of little, um, uh, seedlings all over the place, um, a lot of which were in places that I didn't necessarily want them to be. And so by doing winter seed sowing instead, I'm able to capture those seeds, um, grow them, and then plant those plants where I want them to be instead of, um, you know, all over, all through my garden. And then lastly, here we are, it was about 15 degrees at my house this morning when I left. And um, here we are in the middle of winter and guess what? This is the time to be doing winter seed sowing. So um, this is, this allows those of us who need some garden therapy like me um, to go ahead and get that there, that gardening in now. And so you can plan, you can do this method anywhere from uh, in, in Northern Ohio, really it's like mid January to early February. Um, I have some friends that are um, up closer to Lake Erie who will uh, winter seed sow as late as mid-February, um, but you can do it as early as um, right after the first of the year. So as soon as, um, as, soon as January starts, you're, you can start seed sowing. Um, I like this time of year, mid-January. Mid uh, not all of these seeds need to be cold stratified, but it hits enough of them for the ones like milkweed that need a, um, a good hard uh, freeze. This, this allows those to you to be successful with, um, with germination on those. All right, so few considerations. I have our website up here on the left and I've circled, if you go on our website and you go and you click on things to do, it'll do a little drop down menu, click on education resources and then click on build a rain garden. Now, we are not building a rain garden today. A lot of the plants though that are used in um, rain gardens are, um, well, all of the plants are used in rain gardens are native plants. And I have two resources that are on that page. Uh, one is for native plant nurseries or sources, and the other is a native plant list that is maintained with in the Northeast Ohio Soil and Water Conservation Districts. Um, it's a searchable um, Google Sheet. And so you can search by flower color, bloom time, bloom height, soil conditions, sun requirements, um, just to get an idea of what might be some, you know, either woody trees or shrubs or perennials or annuals that you might want to use in your landscape. And so it's a nice tool. It's not the type of spreadsheet that is printable. <laughs> I mean, it is a, it's, pretty extensive, um, but it's an active uh, document. So um, they do updates in there as more information comes available about um, the habits of some of these plants. So it's a nice resource to use. The native um, in nursery list. Can I have a question? Hi. Um, so your uh, plant, yeah, it, um, I live in a little bit from Ohio, 
uh, kind of like each little about 30 minutes from there. How far does your zone work? Like, will the plants be about the same here as well? So it's good. That's a very good question. So um, that you're probably still with our eco region. And frankly, some of the ones that are on that list are native to the state of Ohio and you know, surrounding areas. Some of them have larger ranges than that. Um, and so you might want to do a little bit more research. Like there are some plants that are on that list that um, I have really switched my thinking to um, focus more on the plants that are native just to our local eco region, because we're, what we're seeing is some plants that are being, um, now I would much rather have you choose a, a native plant that's native to the state of Ohio than a, you know, an ornamental Asian pear tree, right? So, like, <laughs> uh, you know, please, I, I would much rather see that happen. But if you can do a little extra research to see if the plants are, um, native to this local eco region, then that's preferable. Um, you're close enough there. I'm guessing you were breaking up a little bit. So I, I might not have gotten your east. Oh yeah, you're you're gonna be, there, there's gonna be some differences, but most of what you're gonna see on there, um, you'll be able to plant and use. So um, for now for the seed sources, those cover um, nurseries across the state of Ohio. And I point that out because just what I said about um, sourcing, if you can get the closer you can get to that plant naturally growing, so the plant that was used for the seed source or the, um, the seed that created the plant, um, the closer you can get to where that was not, um, where, where that plant was grown, the better. Um, so some of the local nurseries don't necessarily do their own growing so they you know get their plant material or their seeds from um you know places that might not be within their region so i just get into the habit of asking when i go to a, a nursery um asking you know where their where their seed was sourced or where the seed that made that they grew that plant from was sourced um the the nursery industry is very responsive to consumers at the consumer level um, so if you are using a nursery and they are selling plants that are um, treated with neonics, which is a, a group of pesticides that are systemic, that actually persist into the pollen and the nectar and the seed of those plants. A lot of the big box stores, you might see an Echinacea purpurea, you know, a purple coneflower, um, but it's actually been treated with neonics. And so you're putting this great native plant into your garden and unknowingly poisoning the in critters that it's then, um, that are then using it. Um, so asking questions about if they're treated, you know, um, with, uh, with neonics, are they, um, you know, where is the seed source or, I would love to see you offer more native plants. Like maybe you're working with a local nursery and they don't have any native plants that are there. Um, so just being uh, aware and conscientious of, of, of that is, is valuable. Um, the seeds that you received um, or will be receiving for those of you who signed up later um, are from a, um, OPN seed, which is located right here in Portage County. Um, there are other seed um, sources that you can get that are local to, to Northeast Ohio, but we're pretty fortunate to have, um, have that resource that's here. So take a look at, uh, I just wanted to give you, sometimes that's the, the, one of the bigger questions that I get is where can I get these seeds and plants? Um, oh, and finally, uh, the soil and water conservation districts that are in Northeast Ohio, nearly all of them have, including Portage, have a, a tree and shrub sale or seedling sale. And many of them also have either seed sales or uh, plant sales. So um, those are all good resources to get reasonably priced um, plant material that, um, that, is, that is native to the area. So um, check, check their, their websites out too. All right, so what container to use when you're considering your winter seed sowing? We are using um, one gallon jugs today. You do not need to use a one gallon jug. Um, I'll tell you what the requirements are and you can reuse the things that are already maybe in your house. Uh, it needs to, you need to be able to put holes in the bottom for drainage. Um, it needs to have a clear enough top that, uh, that sunlight can get in once the, for one, both to warm it up, but also for once the plants sprout to support their growth. Um, it needs to have, uh, not, it shouldn't be completely open, but like this little, this little top of the jug is enough, is open enough to allow enough rain in 
um, to keep those seeds moist. So you need to have holes, holes in the top and, um, and then you need to be able to open it up in the spring. The nice thing about this method is that we are going to put these seeds in this container, we are gonna tape it up and then we are gonna stick it outside and it's gonna hang out there until May. <laughs> And then you can open it up. Like you don't touch it. Just let it be, let it do its thing. This is low effort. We are just, um, we are just um, putting them in a place where nature can do its thing. So, um, so if you, if you want to use, I've seen um, smaller, like half gallon um, jugs used. I've seen um, plastic, like, you know, like containers that you would get, uh, you might be reusing from food. Yes, bakery containers, things like that, like the clamshells, those kinds of things used. Um, so you you don't have to restrict yourself to, to using a gallon jug. Um, this is just what we're choosing to use today. Yes, and Becca's gonna add something oh, to here. Like Jen said, you might have to add holes to whatever plastic, recycled plastic container you're using. Um, the opaque milk jugs don't work because they don't let in enough sunlight. So I know Jen said it has to be clear enough. If you get those milk jugs that are solid white, they are not going to work. So make sure that it's clear enough that sunlight can get in. Perfect. Okay, the soil that you use, you can use um, the ones that I use, my, the ones I do at home, I use compost. Um, but you should only use compost if you if your compost pile gets hot enough to kill all the seeds that would are in it. Otherwise, you're going to have um, <laughs> the control that we're hoping to gain by being able to grow our plants isn't going to uh, work out because you're going to have seeds sprouting up from you know the seeds that are in your compost bin. Uh, so use a uh, you can use same goes for your garden soil, you could use your garden soil, but you would do, be doing that knowing that there's a chance you're going to whatever the seed bank that's in that soil is, um, uh, they, might, they, they might sprout up. So um, you what you have been provided with is just a real standard potting soil. It does not have to be anything um, crazy uh, expensive or, uh, I mean, you, you, it really just needs to be a soil medium that you can, um, that these seeds can sprout in. You're going to need some scissors or a, you know, a blade, like a box cutter, something like that to, to be able to cut your container if it doesn't have a lid. Um, and then tape. Now, I've seen people use painter's tape or uh, packaging tape, but I recommend using duct tape because it stands up better to the elements here in Northeast Ohio. And then a permanent marker and Optional, you can also have a little, uh, use a so popsicle like stick or a, um, a plant marker. Uh, Cause sometimes if you write, we're gonna write on these um, to label them on the outside, but sometimes by mid-May that gets, that gets weathered away. So if you put a label inside when you plant it, then um, if, you're, if you're planting a bunch of different things, you know what the heck you planted and you yeah. don't have to guess in the spring. Although it's I, kind of fun to ID them. Let me start. Just some yeah. I did see on a winter sewing Facebook group, if you're really concerned about labeling, if you don't have a popsicle stick to stick inside your soil, you can tie a piece of string around the top and then laminate some kind of a label. You just want it to be waterproof for the top. So that would be another way to label them. Or you could tie it around the handle even. Um, I think they use floss actually to tie it on. So oh, nice. <laughs> Nice, very good. So before we get started with the actual planting activity, does anybody have questions? Everybody All right, I love it, <laughs> I love it. Um, so what you're gonna do, I've done a little bit of the prep work for you on, pop this down here. Yeah, there we go. I've done some prep work for you on your, your jug. So the first thing you're going to do um, on one of one side, most of them were on the right side, but <laughs> um, on one side, you'll see this. I've already started um, a little cut for you. So you just take your scissors and you're just going to cut around um, your jug along, along or near that black line. Don't judge my, <laughs> I did that. I did not measure. So <laughs> it just, what you want to end up with is this kind of a scenario here where you have a hinge uh, handle, you have a hinge by your handle so you can open up the top of that container. If you cut too far, it's not the end of the world. You can just nope. tape it on. Nope. <laughs> this, is, this is a very easy Forgive activity, it. you guys. 
<laughs> the other work that I've done for you ahead of time is I've punctured some holes in the bottom of your jug. Um, so there, I'm going to, in a moment, I'm going to turn this over to Becca so she can share her method. Um, I used a, well, on some of them, I used an ice pick. And on others, I used a, I just used my box cutter that I cut the, so I've just made some slits on the bottom. Um, but there's, you just want to get maybe a half a dozen or so holes um, in the bottom, just so that you get the drainage. But Becca used the glue gun method. Yeah, you just want the water to be able to escape. Jen's methods were more violent than mine. Um, <laughs> so you can heat a hot glue gun and use it to, to put holes in the bottom. It takes a little longer and you've got to be patient to hold it against the plastic. It'll kind of melt the plastic. It makes a nice neat hole for those of you who are OCD. <laughs> um, but it does take a little bit longer because you've got to warm up the gun. So stabbing works. You can stab just, it might be so each each preference whatever whatever you can do safely do not hurt yourself you're making holes jen did make holes for you guys though so you've already got them in there <laughs> and you can do a drill so if you look on the oh, some people drill yeah yeah you can do you can do the drill there too so um i have found with the <laughs> these kinds of containers the plastic is so thin that um using a drill is a little excessive <laughs> stop this here. Okay. So you're going to do your, you go ahead and cut that. You've got your hinge. And then the next step is the soil. So um, these are, now when I do this at home, I do more than one. So I just take a tub, dump my soil medium into the tub, and then I get it nice and wet. What you don't want to do is plant these seeds in dry soil. So it's really, this is, this is the most important step short of putting the seeds in. <laughs> so, um, what you have enough soil in here to, to, to plant your jug. So just open it up. There's about, for those of you who don't have a kit in front of you, there is about five cups of soil that are in that that's in here. You just want to make it so you have at least two inches um, and up to four inches. You don't need a super deep um, planting, uh, planting layer. So just pour enough water into there. So pour some water in and then just use your hands and mix that up. And you wanna get the soil moist enough so that when you, it doesn't have to be saturated, um, you wanna be able to form, you wanna be able to form a little ball. So it sort of holds together a little bit when you, when you squeeze it. Yeah. You can get your soil wet, just start with a little bit of water. It's, you can't take water away from this, <laughs> in this, in this application. So start with a little, work it in, it's sort of like working the you know, water into flour. I love, like watching you're some I love watching everybody make it there, <laughs> do their planting. For those who are following along, I've got towels. Yeah, thank you. Safe. I didn't know if you wanted to wipe your hand off before you put it in or not. So, oh, and I can go grab you. We're good here. So, I'll do a okay, yeah. So, I'll just uh, at home, what I'll do is get a big bunch of soil, um, medium, all prepped, and then um, get it to the right consistency. And then I'll just load a bunch of jugs or containers, um, get those all loaded up before I move on to, to seed sowing. So once you have your, um, your soil wet enough, you're just gonna open up the lid of your container. And then you're gonna add the soil to the container. Please reuse your plastic bag. I try to stay away from, I feel like there's a lot of plastic in this activity. My preference is to stay away from plastic as much as possible, but it's, we have so much of it in our life that we might as well reuse the, what we've got that's here. So filled, I filled up my container and then I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna gently press it down. So you can see there, I'm just gonna gently press that down the bottom of the container kind of make a, you don't have to get it all super flat. So those of you who are, who like straight lines, 
Um, in fact, what I'm going to do here, because this is all the soil I have to work with, I'm going to um, build just a little bit up along the sides, just slightly, because these seeds, um, when we plant them, you don't even have to cover them at all. Um, if you, if you don't want to, I usually put just a tiny little layer, like very, very light layer. Remember we're mi mimicking what happens in nature and in nature, they land on the soil that they land on and they work it out. So, <laughs> so you don't have to plant these like you would vegetable seeds. All right. Before I put these seeds into the soil, I wanna have a little chat about the seed mixes. Um, you were asked to give your preference, your light preference. So if you've got the pea, um, that's part shade and part sun. Um, that's part of uh, OPN's um, mix that is the woodland edge mix. So it's for filtered light. Um, some of the plants, these suckers are adaptable. So some of them will grow perfectly fine in, uh, you know, in, in, shade, in a shady condition. They just might, the ones that like a little more sun just get a little taller and leggier. Um, or if you have an S, that's the full sun mix. So there's a list that everybody received. If you got your seed and those of you who will be getting it in the mail, it'll come with a list. All of the plants that are listed on there may not be in your little um, teaspoonful of, of seed, okay? But remember that each one of these seeds represents an individual plant. So there are two different ways that you can choose to plant your jug. You can either separate the different seed types that are in your, um, in your packet and plant just one type of seed in the container at a time, or you can just fill them all up um, and just plant the entire thing in there and sprinkle it off. All that's going to do is change how you use and divide those plants come mid-May. So if you are just putting a few different seeds in and you want just individual specimens that you, know, you want to know that you have five of these plants to put someplace, um, then you're gonna be able to separate out individual plants. If you chock full, you know, plant this chock full of seeds, all that's gonna happen in May is you're gonna have a, it's gonna look like a nice little carpet of green and you can use a knife or just pull those chunks apart and have little chunks of, um, of a mix. Both methods work just fine. It's entirely up to you. Um, so these plants in the mixes that you have are designed to work together. Some of them are uh, annuals that are gonna bloom this year. Uh, so I think most everybody, probably both seed mixes have uh, partridge pea in them, which is one of my favorite little plants. Um, and they're, they're a, a lovely little square black seed. So um, they're really unique. That's an annual, they will reseed. Um, they're often used in these native seed mixes because they're gonna give you some growth and color in the first year. And they help to stabilize that soil and they help to keep other um, plant seeds from like we plants that you don't want to come in and, and take over in that area. So they give a nice natural mulch to your, um, some of your perennials that are going to take, you know, one to two or even three years to, to bloom. So. Yep. So that the, the labeling really comes in for when you are planting one species mm -hmm. per jug, right? If you're for this, for this mix, if you're, especially if you're just learning this method and you really want to see how this seed mix works together, um, there's, there's some research out there about mm -hmm. how those plants support each other, help each other grow actually in meadow conditions. Um, you might just want to label it as your, your partially sunny mix or your, your meadow mix or something. Um, but that what Jen's talking about, getting the individual seeds out. If you don't want to do that, please don't feel like you yep. have to separate these seeds out and try to identify them. That would be for, like I planted um, three jugs of just milkweed. So I labeled them milkweed so I know what they are when they pop up. But don't feel pressured to, <laughs> to ID your seeds by yes. any means. Yes. So once you're ready to plant, you are just going to pull this down. You're just going to sprinkle them in there. I'm putting all of my, my entire packet in here. And then all I'm gonna do is very gently press the seeds into the soil and very gently just add a little, um, a little bit of that soil on top. So we are not, um, for any anytime you're planting any type of seed, there are three different things that need to happen for that seed to germinate. 
for all seeds. Some of them also need, uh, you know, cold stratification like milkweed seeds. Um, Becca's milkweed, if she kept them in her, um, in her warm home over the winter and then planted them in the spring, you're not going to get the germination of those seeds. They require that, uh, that stratification. But all seeds need to have good seed to soil contact. So by pushing them down gently, we're getting that seed to soil contact. You need moisture and you need depending on what seed um, type of seed you have, you need uh, that heat. So we're mimicking these conditions that happen naturally out, outside with these native plants. And so these guys are gonna be nice and happy in there. Anything else before I shut this, shut this guy? I think if you're gonna put your popsicle stick in, don't forget to put it in. Yeah, so once, that is it. So we have, boom. A nice little, and, you, and if you look at my screen, you can see that you, you can still see some of these seeds that are there. Um, they're not completely covered, but they've all got good seed to soil contact. Any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Sure. Uh, um, a lot of the area where I live in Hiram is real wet. Now, now when I transfer these seeds to, uh, you know, the ground, does it matter if it's in a, you know, a real wet area? Good question. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, did you have the sunny or the... Um, I have the partial shade. Okay. So some of the plants that are in here um, are going to work okay for you um, in, in, a, in a wetter area. Um, there are some though that are not going to, to love that. So you're not gonna see, um, you might have some loss, you know, in a, uh, both of these mixes are um, sort of middle of the road moisture condition mixes, um, but, it, but things like um, even the, there, there's a number of the plants, like for example, uh, the Monarda, the, um, the Echinacea, the Rudbeckias, um, the Great Blue Lobelia, like the Lobelia, uh, those, the verbena, um, those should all do okay, unless you're unless it's you're planting it in um, saturated year-round soil. Um, but if no, you it's not usually only, just when we get a lot of rain, you know. The, okay. The yeah, these water. you'll be these should be fine. And yeah. uh, and I didn't really watch the rain for milkweed. Um, I think it was the common milkweed a couple of years ago, and not only does that spread by seed, that it has a massive root system that like was taking over everything. <laughs> I was trying to just keep it in one part of the garden and I finally ended up just, you know, pulling it all out and I got to put it somewhere else, obviously. But, wow. I'm so, I'm so glad you mentioned that. Um, in fact, I'm going to address that. If you, if you have a small garden or you have an area where I, you, you, don't want the plants to um, take to, over. <laughs> one plant to take over. Yeah, it's extra important that you do some research about um, the habits, the the growing habits of the plants that you put in. Um, now, just for the sake of time, I'll just address milkweed. Um, so I mentioned that there are three common. And I say common because they're commonly available now to consumers. You know, I look back and I know some of you on here um, who I've known for a long time and have been in this industry a while can will will agree that you know 20 years ago it was really challenging for homeowners um, or consumer level um, folks to be able to get to get access to a lot of this plant material. And uh, now we have a lot more access than, than we had before. It's still a challenge to find things that are native to our eco region and that are, are grown, um, you know, grown in a way that uh, isn't causing damage to other, um, other critters. But it is way easier now to be able to enjoy and grow these plants in our home gardens than it, than it was decades ago. Um, we, there are three, even though we have other species that are native to this area, um, three that are pretty readily available to all of us are common milkweed, which is the one you referenced. Um, and they do spread, um, they spread underground. You will get this, you know, that's why you see these beautiful clumps in a meadow um, system. If you go out to Dick's Park, um, we planted a meadow and with, uh, through Monarch Watch, we added common milkweed and you'll see these large clusters of, um, of common milkweed plants. Now they don't look like they've taken over the entire meadow. And the reason is 
all that what Becca mentioned with all of these, um, the root systems of all these other um, plants that have grown with them. So you don't get that big explosion where you, they take over the entire meadow. But in your home garden, if you put a common milkweed plant in and you're expecting it to stay where you put it, it's yeah, no. <laughs> an open area where there aren't roots it from other sprout. plants and it, it will, it will really, um, you'll, it'll be sprouting up all over the place. I had a similar experience um, with it in my yard, but swamp milkweed grows in clumps as does, and, and it, it will handle those wet feet it's aptly named. Um, I also have swamp milkweed planted in some upland um, beds and they, it, it does well there too. It's pretty adaptable, um, but it will, it will grow, um, grow in those inundated areas because where we see it out, um, you know, in our parks and, and out in these natural ecosystems, we see it in, um, in wetland areas um, in the long edges of, of water bodies, um, but it stays nicely in a clump. The uh, butterfly weed, um, which is the, the third commonly available milkweed um, plant. It likes dry feet. Um, it will not do well in, in wet areas or heavy soils. Um, it has a beautiful orange flower on it and it also will clump. It's a plant that doesn't like to be moved much. Um, so that's one that if I recommend you starting it from seed um, and if you want it in multiple places, you have multiple plants then to be able to place because they don't really like to be moved in my experience. So yeah. good question. Thank you for bringing up the milkweed. Can you start the seed directly in the ground in like in the fall? Yes, I will tell, I will say though, especially with, um, uh, I've had a lot of success with swamp milkweed and common milkweed, just, you know, letting start direct, see, direct sowing it in the ground. Um, the butterfly weed, I've had more success with that um, by doing it using this winter sowing method. Any other questions? Um, yes, I have one. Do you have to worry about um, this container getting too hot and burning out the seed? No. Okay. You're all good. Set it, set it and forget it. <laughs> so you just want to make sure you've got a nice opening um, and uh, you'll, you'll be pleasantly surprised come May. We, I have, um, if it was a really, really dry spring, mm. if we didn't yeah, get point. any snow, we didn't get any rain. I know we're all hoping for the snowstorm <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> um, you could check in like March, just, you know, just look down the top and see if it's very dry in there. You could add some water would be about the only maintenance mm -hmm. you would need to do just to watch for drying out. But ideally we're gonna get snow, we're gonna get rain, do your snow dance. You mm -hmm. know, the snow will even collect down that hole a little bit, the rain will get in there and they will stay wet enough. But yeah, the only thing I would think would be if it got too dry. Yeah, good point, good point. Come on, Ohio. Come on. <laughs> do <what you're> doing. <laughs> um, the other thing I'll say is you're, you know, you're gonna be able to peek down in there and there, they should get, I mean, your plants in different species grow at different rates and germinate at different times. And so they're not all gonna, don't worry. There are some species that might not germinate um, early and uh, don't, you know, hang on to the hope because, yeah, <laughs> because some of them will, some of them will germinate um, a little bit later. If you have some that have germinated and ha are really growing up, you know, you could really see they're, they're, they're really producing a lot of, um, a lot of leaves and taking up the container. You can open up. It's not going to hurt it to open it. Um, and then if you, if we get a killing frost, um, again, a lot of these, I gotta be honest, um, that, that killing frost protection, um, is more for people who use this method for growing vegetables, which you can do, you can use this for um, vegetable seeds too, this method. Um, but that would be for like, if you're growing tomatoes or, or peppers or something that are really, really sensitive to frost, then you're gonna wanna make sure that you keep them protected. Um, for these native plants, you guys, I mean, imagine again, mimicking natural conditions. Um, when something germinates in late March or early April and starts to grow and we get a killing frost, guess what? it survives. <laughs> so, so they're really uh, hardy, um, you know, hardy, hardy plants. I have a question. Yes. How do you keep them from blowing away? Oh, so the, the themselves, um, they're, they shouldn't dry out. Like Becca was mentioning, they start to get really dry and lightweight. Um, 
you want to add a little water to them, but uh, put them in a place for if we have those, you know, hurricane level winds, <laughs> put them in a place that's a little bit protected um, from the wind. Um, I just keep them out on my deck and, and I get, um, you know, westerly wind that comes across that and I haven't had them blow away. Um, if it's really windy where you are, you could tie something to your handle and then like I've got mine next to the, to my deck. So I could, I could tie mine there if I had to, or each other to keep them if you, if you get a really, cause I'm up on the hill, mm -hmm. so I get a lot of wind through there too, but I'm hoping the soil should be heavy enough mm -hmm. to keep them. I have a question about. So they're getting them. frozen, right? They're, they're really yes. frozen. Yes, yep, they're going to freeze. Hopefully. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully, yes. We're hoping for freezes. I have a question about the size of the garden. I have the full sun seed mix. And if mm -hmm. I planted all of them in one location, what what size of garden size do you think I should tell? Oh, that is a great question. Um, I'm going to, I don't have the label. Oh, wait, I do. Just a moment. Um, do the full sun? Yes. I think I have the... See if I've got it written. Down. Oh, I don't. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. When I send the, I'm going to send a follow up um, email to all of you that has the link. I will make sure that I put in um, approximately because you're getting a portion of the seed packet from you know your seed packet, and I proportion them out for um, to give a little bit to each of you. Um, and I'll include the information on that. So and in, in approximately what the size is. Okay. Yeah. Cause I don't know, have that right in front of me. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Any other I questions? I, I have quick. Um, I know that you guys have provided all of this to us for free. Um, but is there a place where we can make a donation or something? Oh, all of our, so our part, thank you for that question. Um, our, Portage Park District Foundation. Um, they help to support our education program efforts. Um, they sponsor our Wild Hikes Challenge, if those of you who have, um, who have participated in that. And if you go onto our website, they are always um, you know, thrilled to accept any, you know, any donations. And those all go to the Park District um, for programming. Thank you. I have a question. Sure. Can you speak some more about um, the seeds needing to be outside in cold so, sure. that they, so that they will germinate? So some seeds require um, stratification, um, which is like the changing, the freezing, um, and they require that in order to stimulate germination. It's no different. Well, it's similar to, it's just another um, requirement. Like if you go out, out to the Midwest to um, prairie, a prairie ecosystem, like a true tall prairie ecosystem, many of those seeds require like a burn, you know, periodically to stimulate germination. There are um, lots of different for different plants, they require different things to stimulate germination. And um, I'll also include in that, and our USDA did an interesting, um, uh, one of their study trials, they put together a chart of uh, native plants and which ones needed how, you know, a certain amount of, um, of cold and free and, you know, moisture levels. And so that might be interesting to some of you. So I'll include that in the- uh, That would be great. Yeah. And for sure, milkweed? Yes, yes, especially oh. the milkweed. Especially the milkweed, okay. All right, I saw, is it Painley? Rick, yeah. Yeah, so, sorry. Yeah, so I've got, um, I've been making a pollinator garden and by do, what I've been doing is taking like a 10 foot by 10 foot piece of carpeting, killing the grass, removing that, taking, you know, then cleaning that up a little bit. Um, I, since I have the sun mix, which would be better, wait till May, sow the seed directly into that or go ahead and plant this in the milk container and then transplant those i have had yeah it, it really it, it does depend it depends on what you're you know what you're looking for for me i i really enjoy um doing the the winter sowing and then having the option of putting you know putting what i want in there based on what has you know what has germinated um because you're not going to get a hundred percent germination rate on it um and if you're doing like you, you could divide up what you've been given here 
into multiple containers and then, you know, add those in. They're going to be small enough that um, that's not going to impact. But if you don't want to do, if you don't want to do that, it would be okay to, um, to sow them in the spring. Uh, Becca just was working with at her, at her home was working with um, OPN seed on doing a, a large area in the yard and um, they can give, I'll let you. Yeah. Um, so they're, um, OPN is great for any of you you guys want to ask them questions about your specific planting area and how you want to do it because I converted about a tenth of an acre that was grass in my front yard to meadow um, so I did the same thing I, I, I Rick I laid down tarp and killed the grass and then prepared the soil from there um, if you wait until spring to plant there though you will get your growth especially the ones that need cold stratification you won't see until next spring mm -hmm. right so just if you it depends on your patience level um, I would maybe do a little bit of both, you know, do some of the, the, the winter sowing right now, put some of that in there and you could seed too in the spring if you mm -hmm. really wanted to do both. And then you'd have kind of a, a tiered growth thing going on. But if you, yeah, if you wait until spring to plant anything that needs cold stratification, you're probably not going to see growth until the next spring because it'll need, it needs the cold to happen. Does that, does that help a little bit? Yes. Okay. Let's give me a thumbs up. Any other questions? I have a couple of things. Um, first of all, if people were not aware, um, the Western Reserve Land Conservancy is having a native plant symposium going on right now. And I, wa I watched um, the first part of it yesterday, just some mm -hmm. awesome and interesting information. Um, this A quick question is, what about putting um, um, seed starter over those plants? You know what I mean? Rather than soil, if I had some seed starter, could I put that over the seeds? Mm -hmm. Or you would prefer to see it be potting soil? They are not, this is what you have on hand. I've used sand too for, um, you know, for native plants. You just put them on the surface and then spring sand over top of it just to okay. keep it down and maintain just, that seal, that soil contact. Mm -hmm. okay and also I, i'm glad you brought that up i was going to end with sharing some of the things that are going on um uh you know sort of in the area right now there's lots of in, um interesting uh programs that are happening that you can plug into and the western reserve land conservancy's um webinar series is one of those um i'm also listening um, plugged into that and it um it's it's excellent um, uh -huh. The Ohio State University Extension, their um, B Lab. Uh, if you go uh, to, if you if you do a search for Ohio State University Extension um, uh, pollinator series, they have one that's um, going on. It's every Friday. They're they're only on the second speaker of I think five. I believe five. Um, and so, but the, the recordings are available for those too. Um, there, the Soil and Water Conservation District here in Portage County um, is putting on a, a quarterly series with Judy Semrock, um, who's an amazing naturalist. If you haven't heard her speak, um, she has excellent information. And they have one of the, they have a, a, prod, a webinar coming up next week, I believe. Next week, next um, but if you, if you go to portageswcd.org, you can register for that event. Um, and there is, they, they are doing with all four of those, there's going to be either seeds or um, plant material that is available to participants. Um, you know, as part of that. So if you want to get your hands on some more native plants and seeds, um, that would be a good one to plug into. Um, can you, can you state the name of the organization again? Pardon? Can you state the name of that organization one sure. more time? Their website is portageswcd.org and it's the Portage Soil and Water Conservation District. Thank you. Sure. Um, could you also repeat the name of the organization that the um, participant named? I didn't catch it. Sure, it's Western Reserve Land Conservancy. It's their native plant symposium. Yeah, and I can include those links in my email to you guys as well. Perfect. Thank you. All right. You're Joanne. welcome. Did one other, did someone else have a question? Joanne, maybe? I'm, I'm also turning my, some of my front lawn in, into prairie. And I, 
when did you put the cardboard down? And can you do it this time of the cardboard or whatever, tarp? Can you do it this time of the year or do you wait until closer to, you know, early you spring? Could if you, so it takes about six weeks to kill everything underneath. Any time of the year. Eight weeks. So if, wherever you want to start that guess. So if you did it now, then you could plant in the spring. I would think everything would be good and dead by then. <laughs> and, and what do you think about cardboard? Or do you think the tarp's an easier method maybe? Um, I did, I did tarps and it worked really well. Cardboard, you're going to have to worry about blowing away. You're blowing away. Yeah. On top of it. Um, I, I staked the tarps down and put some, I had some extra pavers laying around on top of them and like made my kids stand on it. No. <laughs> <laughs> you really got to worry about whatever material you put down is, is days try to blow, you know, and just be considerate of your neighbors, of course, <laughs> you know, and stuff blowing into their yards. Right. Right. So okay. the, tarps, the tarps stayed down better for me. And I have tarps. So yeah, that, okay. that probably is much easier than collecting yeah, all my friends. Now. I think it's a little more secure. Cardboard. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I've done cardboard a lot. I've, I've used board a lot. And uh, the key is how you can know, get it wet. And yeah. once you get it wet, you can not stuff up straight on it. And, you know, starting smart and it's really nice. Uh, yeah, you can actually plant on top of the cardboard or the newspaper then, yeah. While we've been, uh, while I've been listening, we, I'm just taping, taping up my, my jug here. So that's your, the, your last step is going to be to tape it up and then label it if you need to label it, if you're doing an individual species. So you want to make sure you tape it up enough so you don't have water, that's air that's getting in there. That's going to help, um, help to keep it solid and not blow away. Um, but just take it those sides taped up. Um, there is not, there's a lot of wiggle room, you guys. This is an easy, simple project. So, all right. Any other questions before we wrap up? If I put all of these together in the rain garden, is that going to be useful or will a lot of them not survive being that wet? This isn't a rain garden mix, but there are some of the plants that are in here that would work well in your rain garden, Debbie. If you're looking to keep a, um, a rain garden that looks, um, that's, um, that isn't, uh, doesn't give a naturalized look that gives more of a, um, you know, like more of a um, formal look, then you probably don't want to do a, do the seed, do the seed mix. You'd want to do the individual plants, um, uh, plant those so that you can separate them out and plant them where you want to in the garden. Um, but you're going to see some of them won't make, won't work in a, um, in a wet area. If you look at the rain garden list though, you can, um, you can, you can compare that with your list that is included in your packet and see which one of the plants overlap. Okay, good, thanks. All right, anybody else? I'll make sure how, many, how many people are gonna get their jugs out before the snow comes on Sunday? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Oh, when should we transplant? Oh, like Hopefully. All right. Nice work. Perfect. I like seeing everybody's planting. Nice work. I think I answered most of these now. All right. Yeah, it's hard for us to see the chat on yeah. the screen. Yeah. So. Okay. So um, if you if there's something that comes up and you have an extra question, you've got our contact information. Um, please um, shoot a question our way. Uh, but most importantly, I just want everybody to have fun with this and um, please share your successes with the other people in your life share some of the plants with other people. Um, you will probably have more than you know what to do with um, unless you're, unless you're um, creating, you know, getting rid of some of that yard and um, kudos to that because um, uh, lawn offers little to no ecological value. <laughs> so <laughs> um, it, we really appreciate you guys being on here and being excited. And so please share your enthusiasm with the other people that are in your life and enjoy these plants. Enjoy your winter seed sowing. And I hope you do lots more. No, I can't wait to see pictures. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank You're you. welcome. Have a great rest of the day and let's bring on the snow. <laughs>